Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a perfumer's portfolio video and not just any perfumer's portfolio video, but a ranked perfumer's portfolio video on a legend. Actually, a legend that, in my opinion, doesn't get anywhere near the love and adoration and attention that he deserves if the information that I have is true. So, there are a couple fragrances that are dead smack at the top of this list. If it's true that he actually made these fragrances or helped in some way, uh, because I think if a perfumer works with another perfumer on a fragrance, they deserve credit. Even if it's not their main work, let's say they made the top of a fragrance or the base or something, you know, their contribution should still be recognized. So for me, uh, if some of the information that I have received that places the top two fragrances on the list right in his wheelhouse that he actually did help produce these fragrances. One of the all-time greatest perfumers ever, as far as I'm concerned. Also, I would say sort of a mentor and a, and a teacher to many up-and-coming perfumers who came along in the late 70s, 80s, um, that uh, he was able to sort of work with uh, and bring them along as well. So he was a, a mentor, a coach, a teacher, if you will. And today we're going to talk about the great Raymond Chailin. Now, if you're not aware, he actually also has a son who's in the perfume industry as well. His name is Jean-Marc Chailin. And uh, Jean-Marc's resume is pretty thick, actually, um, ranging from 2000 and... Uh, to early 2000s, I would say, until the modern times, but um, that'll be a video for another day. But just so you know, as far as his lineage goes, he definitely has, um, you know, he has his his heirs working in the perfume industry as well. It truly is a family business to the Shy Land. So um, this is going to be a ranked list. This is actually going to be a ranked top eight, okay, eight fragrances in my collection that I am attributing to Raymond Chailin. Um, and so we're going to rank them, my, my least favorite to my most favorite. And as I always do with these videos, I have to just give the normal disclaimer that my ranking is just my personal opinion. I'm not saying number one is better than number eight, I'm not saying number two is better than number seven, so forth and so on. Uh, these are just my personal opinion. And they're as of today, September the 6th of 2023, obviously that ranking can change as time goes on. So let's do scent of the day first. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Raymond Chailin, the man, and his background and how he became a perfumer. And then we're going to get into the scent. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is scent of the day. And obviously I went to work today. I went to the office today, hence the button up shirt. And so today I actually wore this. I wore a Roja fragrance, which I only have a little decant of. And this is... Roja's Majestic Oud Parfum. This is discontinued. I actually saw a bottle on eBay for five grand. Uh, someone smoking crack, I think. No one better pay that. Um, this is all I have left. And you know what's funny is, I was counting my wares, and I did have a second decant. I think it was a five mil decant also, but I've worn this 10 times. So look at this, this and also the other five mils. So 10 times I've worn, given this full wares. And I do spray pretty liberally. Um, if you're interested in this discontinued Roja fragrance that is extremely expensive and hard to find, uh, go check out my review. I actually have a full review on this fragrance, and uh, so if you want my in-depth thoughts, you can go check out my video on Majestic Oud. Don't pay whatever the scalpers are, are asking. Honestly, it's not worth it in my opinion. Go get one of Russian Adams' new compositions once the bottles get released or something like that. Don't give, for, for this type of composition, it's not worth what, what the fragrance is going for in the aftermarket. But I got this before it got discontinued, and I got a really good price on this little Discovery Atomizer. So, you know, this 7.5 mils has actually lasted me a really long time. This is what the old Roja um, Discovery Atomizers used to look like, by the way, before they come in, came in that fancy felt, you know, padded, double boxed. It just used to be like this uh, with a little sticker on it so anyways cool stuff majestic oud enjoy the perfume um but value for money is really off there there's a big fat osmanthus note in this fragrance as well doesn't smell like there's any real oud in here i'm not saying that roja didn't put a tiny little drop just to say there is real oud but it doesn't smell to me like there's real oud 
this, especially for the money that you're paying, this retailed for almost $2,000 retail. Um, it was like $1,750, I think. Same price as Sheeper Extraordinaire and Great Britain and that purple cap line, you know what I mean? Um, and they've since dropped the price of Sheeper Extraordinaire and Great Britain uh, to 750 pounds, I believe. So they just shaved a thousand off the top, which is just crazy to me. But this one, they just out and out discontinued. Who knows why? But um, it's it's not necessarily that it's a bad fragrance. It's just when you're spending that kind of money, you really expect to smell the highest quality ingredients. And this feels like a fragrance that is meant to kind of trick people who are walking through Harrods or something and you know, they just have a bag of money in their pocket because they're just super rich and spending this kind of money on a fragrance means nothing to them. So they've never smelled real oud. They smell this, they see the price tag, they see the glistening cap and they must think that's what oud smells like and they and they buy it. And it is a nice fragrance. Like I said, I wore it at the office. People like it at the office. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's not something I would ever spend that kind of cash on. So anyways, but go check out my review if you're interested in learning more. Majestic Oud by Roja Parfums from 2018. That was my scent of the day. All right, so let's read a little bit about Raymond Chailin. He uh, he worked for Fermaniche for a long time, and I think he's created something like 27 to 30 fragrances in his that are authored to him. So he was born in Nice in 1935. He grew up in Barem, surrounded by his grandfather's lavender fields and beehives. This exposure to nature's scents and beauty cultivated his fascination with the world of fragrances. In 1962, he began his career at Antoine Crisis in Grasse, where he owned his skills and was eventually promoted to perfumer. In 1969, Raymond Chailin moved to Paddy to work for Ruhr Bertrand Dupont. Dupont. He continued to refine his craft at various renowned perfume houses, including Fermaniche and Dragoco. In 1988, he became the director of perfumery research at J&E Sozio, excuse me, before becoming the director at Argville in 1993. As president of the Société Française de Parfumeurs from 95 to 97, he contributed significantly to developing the French perfume industry. Today, he remains involved as a member of the Comité Directeur. His childhood experiences deeply influence Raymond Chailin's approach to perfume creation in the French countryside. Drawing inspiration from nature's bounty, he infuses his fragrances with a sense of timelessness, elegance, and authenticity. His compositions are characterized by their ability to evoke memories and transport wearers to the idyllic landscapes that inspired them. Throughout his illustrious career, Shailan has collaborated with numerous prestigious brands such as, okay, enough of that. Um, I don't want to read all the list of the brands he, he worked with, but it is substantial. And... Um, his passion for perfumery has been passed down to his son, like I said, Jean-Marc Chailin, who is also a renowned perfumer. His legacy lives through many of his timeless and beloved fragrances, uh, creations, and his contributions to the Société Francois de Parfumer. Sorry to the French speakers for my Texas tongue, but uh, it's just the way it is. So, um, interesting that his grandfather kept lavender fields and beehives, and that's sort of what got him interested in scents and fragrances. I wonder what his life was like from 1935 to 1962 when he sort of started as a perfumer um, and eventually became a full-on uh, perfumer. And um, I was actually, I was looking at a quote that he said, and it's interesting because some of his masterpieces, if you will, I will tell you I've never smelled. Like, uh, for example, he did a feminine fragrance from the House of Aragons called Aragons Pour Femme that came out in 82. Never smelled it. Um, probably his most famous creation is Anai and I from Cacherelle, 1978. Never smelled it. Um, there was also like a concentrate version of that fragrance. Never smelled it. The one that I am most interested in smelling is Monsieur Carven. I've never smelled that one either. That is high on the list of... Um, fragrances that I would love to actually own. I'd love to own a bottle of Mons Monsieur Carven. Um, that's from 1978. Very hard to find. He also did uh, a fragrance for Jacques Fott called Expression. Never smelled it. And uh, Jean Cout Courtier called Monsieur Courtier. That's another one I would love to smell from 76. Very hard to find. So he's done some things. He did a Nina Ricci fragrance as well. Uh, 
Signorici, I believe it was called. Never smelled that one. And um, there's, of course, other things he did. Fragrances for Robert Piguet and stuff like that. Uh, Yves Rocher. He did uh, an Eau de Vetiver from the early 80s. I've never smelled. Um, and so... It is um, very interesting, though, his little breakdown. There's a lot of his fragrances, especially, I think, the biggest hit, no one would argue, his biggest hit is the Cacherelle fragrance for women. That was huge in the late 70s, early 80s. I've never had a chance to smell that. Um, but um, I, I'm a big fan of his work. And But one thing that he said that I thought I would share with you guys is a quote. I actually um, saved the quote here. He was talking about... Uh, at the SFP's 70th anniversary. He was talking about the lack of statutory recognition and consideration that was affecting the perfume profession. He says, doctors, lawyers, architects, artisans are registered into an organization or an association which gives them a legal legitimacy. Us perfumers, we have nothing. And that was said in 2012. A lot has happened in the industry in the last 11 years. But, um, you know, it, uh, I think for him, it was sort of giving a voice to the institution as, as a perfumer and his sort of disenfranchisement with the industry as a whole. And it's hard to blame him, actually. Um, I would be very curious as to what he makes of the industry today in 2023, um, you know, with the context of everything that's going on with, you know, stuff like YouTube and perfumers getting their names on the bottles and all of the things that have been happening in, in the fragrance game. Um, but anyways, that's just a little background on the man um, and sort of his his story of how he became a perfumer and, and his commitment to the industry that even well into his retirement, he's still uh, attending things like the uh, SFP 70th anniversary. So let's get started. Uh, again, this is going to be a top eight, okay? And some of these I have taken some liberty on, and we'll talk a little bit about what that liberty is. Number eight is one such fragrance that I have taken a little bit of liberty up. Excuse me. And it's actually Boucheron Porhomme. Now, um, probably Boucheron's most famous fragrance is called Jaipur Om, in my opinion. I think Jaipur Om sort of takes the cake as far as Boucheron masculine fragrances go. This plays a little bit of a second fiddle. And Boucheron Porhomme is a style that is actually not my favorite style because it's a very citrus heavy type perfume. But what makes it very interesting, it came out in 1989 according to Parfumo, although there are some other sites that disagree and actually list this as coming out in the early 90s, but I always use Parfumo, so I'm gonna stick with Parfumo. And actually, I'm gonna grab a little blotter because I wanna spray this, so don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere indeed, okay. So, I just want to spray this real quick, because it's been a little bit since I've sprayed Boucheron Pour Homme. But um, one thing that you will notice, and the reason why I said I'm taking a little bit of liberty with this uh, particular bottle here, is that the bottle that I have... So, the bottle that I have was actually created... Uh, or the most recent reformulation, which happened in 2011... Yeah, it opens up very spicy and very citrusy. There's a note of um, basil, and there's a vervain note, and there's a little bit of lavender. But the reason why I'm saying I'm taking a little bit of liberty on this is because the reformulation from 2011, which I have, which you can actually see is done by Interparfums. Interparfums is a good firm. I really like Interparfums. They uh, are a good distributor and uh, marketer if you will. Um, but I don't know what this version has in common with the original version from 1989. That's why I say I'm taking a little bit of liberty. The original version from 89 was marketed by PCI, which is Parfums and Cosmetiques International. That's the one you actually want if you want the true vintage. Uh, but it's basically like a woody, spicy, citrusy type composition. And the reason why I list this eight is because it's a little bit harsh. This particular version is a little scratchy. It's a little harsh. It doesn't have sort of the um, the way that his fragrances flow and, and gel together like some of the other citruses fragrances that are coming up. Actually, as far as 
citrus heavy masculine scents go, you're going to see some of the all-time great, some of my all-time favorite citrus heavy masculine perfumes were done by Raymond Chiland. And so that's why I say I'm taking a little bit of liberty putting this number eight because I've only smelled this bottle. This is the only one that I've smelled, the 2011 version. And his name is not even put on that, even though he created it. Um, there's no perfumer, I don't think, listed for the 2011 reformulation, but he created the OG in 1989. So I would love to find a vintage bottle of Boucheron Pour Homme one day and just see, because I bet you the vintage bottle is better. That has been my experience normally. If you follow my channel, you know I'm all about the vintage, uh, the particular version and all that good stuff. So, but one thing that you will notice about Boucheron Pour Homme, and the reason I still like it, the reason I own a bottle is because... Even though it has that citrusy, uh, lemony sort of basil type opening with lavender and then old school carnation and, and that floral heart, which they um, is was very common in these type of masculine perfumes from the past, uh, Rose and Jasmine and Lily of the Valley and Oris and Ylang Ylang. Um, one thing that Raymond Shailan always did with his citrus compositions, even maybe the most popular one, which we'll talk about as we go deeper into the countdown, there always is a as a base that is paid particular attention to. The base is not ignored in Raymond Chiland's creations. In fact, that's why I, th I think he would be a great perfumer for Roja Dove because Roja loves base heavy perfumes. You know, lots of base notes, and Raymond Chiland pays particular attention to the base of his fragrances. And so, what ends up happening, even with uh, Boucheron Pour Homme, is there is this patchouli sandalwood, a little bit of oak moss, a um, little bit of like frankincense and benzoin and tonka in the base and all that stuff. And, and there's just a little bit of heft to it. You know what I mean? Like, um, like um, it's, it's not necessarily just a airy, flighty citrus fragrance that flies off your skin. No, there's actually heft and um, depth and the base anchors everything down. And you can tell he paid particular attention to the base. Um, so yes, I, um, I like this, but I'm very curious as to what the OG, the vintage smells like, but, uh, Boucheron Pour Homme comes in at number eight. Number seven, number seven, and this is really, really hard for me to put it number seven because I think that this is one of the greatest green fragrances ever created. Actually, um, I'm just gonna grab a comparison real quick so you have something to compare to, so... In the 60s, this came out, YSLY, okay? The original YSLY, not the shit they put out for men that they called Y. Um, this is the original YSLY for women. Fantastic. I think this fragrance um, inspired many years of green fragrances. In fact, I think this fragrance is the reason why the 70s is known as this sort of green decade, if you will. YSLY was a huge inspiration. It was the very first YSL fragrance, and um, it inspired stuff like Estee Lauder's Private Collection, which is one of my favorite green fragrances of all time. This is absolutely stunning. Um, and it inspired things like this. And this is Givenchy number three. So this is number seven in the countdown list. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background as to how, where this sits, right? So um, Givenchy three is basically a green um, floral sheepra is basically what it is, okay? It opens up with notes of aldehydes, galbanum, peach, gardenia, and Raymond Chiland did not do this alone. So he actually did it with Jean-Francois Latty and IFF, all right? So, um, uh, so, um, and you can see this is actually a vintage bottle. You can tell a lot of ways, but um, one of them is the 90 proof volume right there. Um, another one is the, um, well, just the bottle style. They have uh, changed it actually many times. Uh, this particular version, the original version from 1970, has been completely discontinued. And But if you're a Sheepra lover, if you love that sort of, um, that labdanum, oak mossy, mossy, dirty base, uh, what he ended up doing here is making it even more dirty in the base because he's added things like castorium, and, but it's a green Sheepra. I mean, if you like things like, um, 
You have to think, Chanel number 19, one of the greatest green Sheepras of all time, came one year after this. So speaking of inspiration, right, this is right there in the mix as far as I'm concerned. It is spot on beautiful. The details, everything they did in this, this is what perfume used to be. I can only imagine how much time someone like Raymond Shailam put into creating Givenchy 3 uh, in, in this particular form. If you want the notes, the full note, well, not the full note listing, but I don't know if you can see that with the reflection there, but um, that is the official, uh, this was a tester bottle that I got from the great Anuj. So it says Muguet, Jasmine, Mousse de Chine, Oak Moss, um, uh, and it says, well, I guess it doesn't give very much on the note listing, just says that in different languages, but, um, but there's Carnation, there's Iris, there's a beautiful Iris note in here actually, Narcissus, Rose, Jasmine, Lily of the Valley, and then what he also did, again, focusing on the base, is there's that castorium, like I said, it gets a little bit dirty in the base, which I love, um, and he added myrrh, all right, and so there's a little bit of this warm, like, uh, slightly licorice feel from the myrrh here, and vetiver, and the vetiver, of course, is green, the patchouli in the base is green, the oak moss in the base is green, and they used real ambergris in this original formula, and he's actually done that ambergris tick trick a couple times with his fragrances. We'll talk about, um, we will talk about um, another fragrance which he used ambergris in, in the base, really actually coming up next. Um, but if you're a fan of green fragrances, if you like Chanel's number 19, if you like Private Collection by Estee Lauder, if you like um, YSL's Y, the OG YSL Y, I would really urge you to check out Raymond Shyland's uh, Givenchy 3. If you can get it in the original form, it's one of the greatest green Sheepras ever created, I think. Um, I mean, when you spray it, the grandness of it, just the attention to detail, the style. I mean, I don't know if they'll ever, that type of perfume will ever be able to re be recreated anymore because of the oak moss sort of... Um, banned by IFRA, at least not from the big French houses. You'd have to go to Arige la Doré and Bortnikoff and all that stuff nowadays, but you got to go to the artisanal houses, which is a shame because I wish Givenchy could create something like this again. I wish this generation could smell what um, what vintage perfume used to be when, when the restrictions weren't there and when the time that got put into the, you know, compositions were there. You know, now they they put this out in April and July, August, they're already marketing another fragrance. It's absolutely crazy. Um, and so the good old days, green Sheepra, extra, you know, one of the great green Sheepras, an extraordinary green Sheepra from 1970, Givenchy 3 at number seven. Number six. Number six is the newest fragrance um, to, to my Raymond Chilin collection. And I was blown away by it. In fact, when I first made this list, I actually put it ahead of number, uh, it was number five, not number six. But when I really thought about Raymond Shyland's contribution to fragrances, I had to move it back one and put, um, make number five what it was. But this is a absolutely stunning fragrance and it's totally overlooked. And it's one where if you asked me, I've got 40 or 50 bucks. I want a vintage fragrance. Um, and I want one that's sort of under the radar, right? One that hasn't been hyped up. I can't afford, let's say, or I don't want to afford, not that you can't afford it because maybe you can, you just don't want to spend the money, but let's say I don't want to afford, um, you know, something like Patu Pour Homme. I don't want to spend a thousand dollars on Patu Pour Homme. Give me an under the radar vintage fragrance to buy that will blow my socks off. This is my recommendation. This is number six on the list. It is Pierre Cardin's Blue Marine Pour Louis. Okay, Pierre Cardin, Blue Marine Pour Louis. And um, there is the name, if you would like to read it. Um, Blue Marine Pour Louis. Now, uh, first thing I have to tell you, this is not a blue fragrance, okay? If anything, maybe there is a tiny bit of dihydromersinol, maybe. Because, you know, dihydromersinol sort of started very, very small with Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. And it increased with things like Dracar Noir's huge dihydromersinol. By 1986, 
This is only a couple years before Cool Water came out. You have to remember. So the name is very interesting because you can already see the trend shifting towards this, um, you know, I don't know if there's any real aquatic notes in here or anything like that. It doesn't smell like there are. And that's what throws people off about this fragrance. And I think that's the reason why you can still even find this for respectable prices. I think if people knew what this was, the price would be jacked. 100% it would be. And I have to thank Anuj for um, setting this bottle aside for me. I, I told him I wanted it. And then between the time I was basically able to buy it, I had some issues in my life. And I said, hey, I don't think I can buy it anymore. He sent it to me anyway. That's just the kind of guy he is. So shout out to Anuj at Enchante Perfumes. And uh, But I have been extremely smitten with this. I've worn this twice now since I've, since I've received it from him. And... Um, Man, every time I'm just blown away by it. So basically, um, what Blue Marine Pour Louis is, it was created in 1986 by Raymond Chilin and Martin Gross. And if you know Martin Gross, he is a big name. He was actually a big boss. He was like a, a boss of one of the big fragrance companies, if you will. But his claim to fame, as far as I'm concerned, is Lapidus Pour Homme. He did Lapidus Pour Homme. He will always be an all-star vintage perfumer as far as I'm concerned. He also did the original 1881 Chiruti Porom, which is very similar um, in setup to Boucheron Porom. Not necessarily in smell, but in that the original from 2005 that he did is much different, I think, than the modern 1881 Porom. So I would love to get a vintage um, bottle of of. 1881 Porom as well, but Martin Gross was sort of like a a little bit of a, he ended up going into like management, I think, in the uh, fragrance world, in the fragrance game, and, uh, but at this point, he was still a perfumer, and he, he worked with Raymond Chilin on creating Blue Marine, and Blue Marine is basically almost like a leathery fougere, okay, so if you like the 80s style leather fougeres, um, I mean, imagine mixing Paco Rabanne Porom with um, something like, um, imagine mixing Paco Rabanne Pour Homme with like a leathery fougere, like um, like Smalto Pour Homme. Like imagine Smalto Pour Homme mixed with Paco Rabanne Pour Homme. But there's notes in here like clove. And there's a beautiful spruce note in here as well. Spruce is a very underrated note, I think, for masculine perfumery, or just perfumery in general, but I think it's brilliant in a masculine perfume. But this opens up very, very green to my nose. There's a lot of mugwort, artemisia, basil, um, clary sage, like the sweaty clary sage with um, thyme, which can also have a little bit of a leathery herbal aspect to it. Thyme can come across as leathery. There's also leather in the base with labdanum. And so even though I think this smells more like a fougere, um, there is that labdanum in the base with frankincense. Again, very similar sort of base setup to what he did with the original Boucheron Poron because there's frankincense, there's labdanum, there's benzoin, there's moss, there's ambergris, okay? Now, so this one actually has ambergris. Um, Boucheron Poron did not, but Givenchy 3 did have ambergris. And so, and back then, they were using real ambergris. It's crazy that a Pierre Cardin that costed $10 back in the day had real ambergris in it. Um, it. It smells like you're smelling an extremely high quality fragrance. There is nothing cheap about this fragrance. The only thing cheap about it is the cap, honestly. The cap on these are, are shite. Um, the sprayer on it is shite, okay? But uh, everything else is the, the fragrance itself, the smell, smells extremely high quality. And you can see this is distributed by um, Shelton. So at the time, Shelton owned Old Spice and Pierre Cardin's distribution. Um, but what a perfume this is. So originally, the fragrance was produced by um, SDNP, Shelton. And then later, Coty took on the uh, contract. So I don't know what the newer bottles that Coty made of Blue Marine Pour Louis, but if you can find these vintage bottles, they are a gem, a hidden gem for 30 or 40 bucks or whatever it's going for nowadays. Absolute hidden gem. Um, I'm so impressed with this. And it's nothing like you would expect from the name. So it's kind of kept people away, I think. It's kept the price low because you can still, you know, people are like, I don't want a blue aquatic fragrance from Pierre Cardin or whatever. It's not that at all. It's more of a leathery fougere. 
Um, so I think if you're a vintage head who likes the things that I like, give Blue Marine by um, Pierre Cardin a try. Blue Marine, poor Louis. All right, so that was number six. Number five. Number five is uh, probably one of the most influential masculine fragrances of the 1970s. It came out in 1971. 1971 was a big year for Raymond Chalain, I'll tell you that. He released two blockbusters in 1971, and actually it's very hard for me to rank number five and number four. You could easily flip them depending on taste. But I ended up putting this at number five, um, and this is the great YSL Pour Homme, which is unbelievably discontinued, shockingly discontinued. Um, if if you've um, if you've seen some of the old advertisements, you have uh, undoubtedly seen the most one of the most famous uh, marketing photos that has ever happened for a perfume. It's basically Yves Saint Laurent, the man posing butt-ass naked for this fragrance. And actually, this was his signature scent until the day he died. He wore YSL Pour Homme basically until the day he died. Um, this is what the original bottle looked like. And you can see with the 87 proof. And actually, this bottle kind of screwed me over because as beautiful as it is, um, it was a pressurized bottle. And it had been pressurized for so long. I think this is actually a 1970s bottle. And it came from Japan. And so whenever I went to actually go try to use it, the top, which you can see there's no more sprayer on there, right? It just completely like blew off. So there was nothing holding it anymore. And it was like a champagne bottle. It was just like shooting fragrance all over the place. Like my room smelled like YSL Pour Homme for months. Um, and I, I saved as much as I could. What was crazy is even when I would save it into a... Like, let's say I'd put it into like a little, because I had these 10 ml uh, decanters. It was so, um, you know, almost like uh, charged. Like the, it was almost like the fragrance was bubbling because of the um, pressure, right? So even though I poured it out of the bottle, it was still bubbling inside of the 10 ml decant. So it was just spilling it everywhere. Even when I tr managed to save some, it was a nightmare. But this is how much I have left. I'm still very happy to have this because this is a very, in this form, with the, this is kept impeccably. I don't think it got sprayed before I, before I tried to, I messed it up. Um, but one of the risks of vintage fragrances, but I'll tell you what, this is absolutely stunning stuff. And probably one of the greatest citrus heavy masculine fragrances ever created. And this one and the next one coming up. And, and Raymond Chalain had that touch. Remember earlier we were talking about how he grew up within his grandfather's uh, lavender fields and beehives, right? And he was really fascinated with um, sort of making things smell very natural is was sort of his thing you know he was big into making his fragrances have this naturalistic feel and he really did that with these citrus heavy perfumes and again going back to what i was talking about earlier so the the note listing on ysl pour Homme, according to parfumo is lemon bergamot lavender lemon vervain and petit gras in the top with thyme clary sage rosemary brazilian rosewood cardation geranium and marjoram and then a base of musk, patchouli, sandalwood, vetiver, amber, cedar, and tonka bean. So again, there is a little bit of a hefty base, but you notice there's no labdanum. There's no leather in this. Um, so your nose really is able to focus on the citrusy herbal aspects. Like you really realize things like the petit gras, right? Like the sticks and twigs of the orange blossom tree. Or you really notice the herbal thyme note in here. Or the rosemary. It's sort of like a waxy, oily rosemary note in here. And so you notice things like the spices because there isn't a big, giant, leathery labdanum in the base, which normally I love. But here it allows you to really focus on the beautiful, beautiful citrus notes that were used. The lemon, the bergamot, top notch. One of the, one of the best uses of lemon and bergamot in a, in a citrus-heavy masculine. I would even take this over Chanel's Pour Monsieur, believe it or not. Now, I've never smelled the original Chanel for men. I only have smelled the newer version, although I really do like the Chanel Pour Monsieur Con uh, Cologne Concentrate from the late 80s. That has, that's more of my personal taste. I, I'd put that more head-to-head -head with this than the original Pour Monsieur. 
Um, but I, that's how much I really rate um, Raymond Shyland's ability, ability to create these citrus heavy scents. So um, YSL Pour Homme, I will, I will easily, some could say, this is my signature scent. This is number one for Raymond Shyland. Um, for me, I had to make some tough choices and this ended up coming in at number five, unbelievably discontinued, while YSL is putting out shite like baby cat and just, it just really pisses me off in myself. Like what has happened to YSL? One of the worst fall from grace stories I think I've ever uh, heard in the perfume world. It is an absolute, they should honestly be ashamed of themselves. Like what they've done to Yves Saint Laurent's house, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should not show their faces in public. It is an absolute travesty. Travesty what they've done. Even their niche line is pathetic. Um, I don't think I've smelled one from the niche line that has made me go, that's it. I need to go spend 350 bucks on that. No. Uh, the stuff they put out like, um, let's see if I have it right here. I forget what I did with it, but um, ah, yes, I do have it right here. Just since we're on a tangent. Like this was sent to me by Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Very kind of you. Stuff like this, tuxedo, absolutely pathetic. This does not belong in a niche. This belongs, this is a designer. This is an out and out designer. You know, this should have been YSL myself and they should have had a real proper niche line. Um, so I'm gonna review this one day and it won't be a pretty review, I'll tell you that. But um, even their expensive high end line is, is a disgrace. Anyways, enough about the house of YSL. But um, this is when they were really firing on all cylinders and another YSL is going to come up here very soon. But first we're going to do number uh, four on the list. Now number four on the list, many people, this is a grail fragrance to, to many people. Um, this is, some people say that this is sort of the point where perfume died. Like everything after this fragrance is dead. And so even some of my, my most favorite fragrances of all time, some of the old timers say that this is basically the height of, of perfume perfection. Um, and I could see why, like if you like this style of fragrances, this is not my favorite style, but uh, if you like this style of fragrances, I could completely see why you would make a comparison like that. This is the original Balenciaga Ho Hang from 1971. So both of these came out in 71. Raymond Shyland was a busy boy in 71. And this is discontinued and this fetches a real pretty penny, okay? Um, so, Ho Hang um, by Balenciaga is sort of their version of a citrusy, woody, spicy fragrance. And listen to the notes. Bergamot, lemon, mint, and orange. So, interest it. <laughs> see if I can talk here. So, instantly, you notice that uh, there's a couple things different from YSL Pour Homme. You notice that there's mint in the top and that there's an orange note used. There's no orange in YSL Pour Homme. There's rosewood in the base, which again, rosewood. There's cedar and patchouli, all notes used in, in YSL Pour Homme, I believe. Um, and there is a note of pele pelagonium. All right, so pelagonium is not a note that is used in, in YSL Pour Homme, by the way. So there's another distinction, if you will. Um, and then finally in the base, we have benzoin, tonka, vanilla, and labdanum. And it's really, to me, it's that labdanum base that jumps this up ahead of YSL Pour Homme. So if you're somebody who, um, uh, if, if you're somebody who I would say likes to have the focus more on the uh, citrusy aspects of the fragrance, you'll probably like YSL Pour Homme more. If you're somebody who prefers to have the um, more resinous, leathery, sticky aspects of the fragrance come out more, you'll probably prefer Ho Hang Club. Because for me, again, remember, Raymond Shyland really loves focusing on the base. And um, so apparently pe uh, pele pelagoniums are a very similar flower to a geranium. So it's almost like a... 
type of geranium, if you will. I don't know how the smell differs from a geranium. If anyone actually knows how the smell differs from a geranium, I'd love to hear your thoughts, leave it in the comments. Um, but this was actually uh, perfumed with Jacques Jensen. So they had a, a duo perfumer, Raymond Chalin and Jacques Jensen. Um, and, but this is literally one of my favorite citrus fragrances of all time. Uh, I, if, if you forced me to wear citrus fragrances, I would wear these two. You know, I, these would probably be my go-tos. They're just perfect for my taste as a vintage lover. Absolute perfection. Um, you know, some, I've, I've, uh, I've seen, like I said, I've seen some old timers say this is the height of the fragrance world and everything else is downhill from there. Most people like me probably put that point somewhere in 93, 94 time frame. But there are some old timers that are like, nope, 1971, ho hang, that's the peak, everything else is. And I disagree with that. I disagree with that sentiment even for, even though I say early to mid 90s is where that big transition happened, I still think there's a lot of more modern fragrances that are worth checking out. But um, that is a holy grail fragrance, if you will. So that is um, number four. Ho Hang by Balenciaga. Number three. Number three is, I think, one of the most unsung honey compositions ever. And I actually have two different versions of this fragrance. Um, I have the OG, the original, Marbert Man, in Eau de Cologne. These do not come up very often for sale. I was very lucky to, to snag this. No one bid against me, and I got it for like the starting bid of like 110 bucks or something. This could easily be two, three, four hundred dollars. Uh, these Eau de Cologne Marbert Mans do not come up for sale very often. And then in the early 2000s, I think they basically went through like a packaging change, reformulation, if you will. But they smell very close. I'll do a comparison video for you guys if you're interested one day. They smell very, very close. So this is Marbert Man Eau de Toilette. You notice it does not say classic though. Classic came after this version. So this is late 90s, early 2000s, I think. And then after that, then they ended up putting out what, what was known as Marbert Man Classic. I've never smelled that one. That one may be a little bit different, but this is this uh, lemon, mugwort, aldehydes, basil, bergamot, and lavender with carnation, honey, cinnamon, geranium, juniper, and rose with ambergris, musk, cedarwood, patchouli, leather, moss, and sandalwood. And so if you've ever smelled the uh, original Alain Delon. So uh, Alain Delon originally came out with a fragrance in 1980, I believe it was. If you've smelled that, there's a very interesting sort of um, back and forth, uh, if you will, this sort of uh, composition where it started out very green at the top, but uh, what ended up happening is it dries down to sort of a fresher honey. There is a lot of geranium in, in Alain Delon as well. I'm not sure exactly when Marbert Man originally came out. I will tell you that. That is something that uh, uh, Parfumo does not show either on the Eau de Toilette version or the Eau de Cologne version. There's no date listed on either, so I'm not 100% sure on when this came out. But I know it's in the 70s, sometime in the um, 1970s, I believe. And so, um, so yes, I mean, if you're a honey fan, if, you, if you're someone who loves honey fragrances, like I love honey fragrances, but may, so I think this came out in 77, if I'm not mistaken, but let's just, let's just say it's 77 for argument's sake, okay? So... If you're somebody who loves something like um, Boss Number no. One, for example, if you even like kind of the honeyed aspects of Alain Delon, which came out a couple years after this and I think was inspired by Marbert Mann, if you are a fan of um, uh, Givenchy Gentleman from 74, which this may be a little bit of play on what was so popular in the patchouli era of the 1970s, then I really would say give Marbert Man a try. Mar Honey's one of my favorite notes of all time. Um, and so this is a very, what's so crazy about this fragrance is, yes, it is sort of this macho man, sort of vintage old school vibe, but the way he was able to engineer the honey it's, it's so well blended in a way that it feels fresh. The honey doesn't feel heavy and thick like in um, um, Givenchy's Gentleman, which I love the thick 
you know, animalic type honey. Here, it just comes across as fresh somehow, uh, versatile, if you will. You know, someone, some, some, uh, a fragrance that you can wear to many different events, many different weathers, and, and fit right in. You know, this is not just a fragrance to wear in the winter. I love actually my favorite time to wear this, and um, Alain Delon, the original classic, is in the heat. I think they really shine in the heat because most people have never smelled a honey fragrance that does what these do. I think that uh, B by Zoologist tried to do a honey that was kind of like this, but they didn't get anywhere close to, to the perfection of something like Margaret Van or the original Alain Delon. So um, yes, I would definitely, that is that easily could be number one, but there are two other amazing fragrances that have since popped up on my list. So here's what makes this list hard is if you just go off of Parfumo, that's it. That's basically the end of the list. These two don't even show up on Parfumo. However, recently, Fragrantica has added one, and they added it because of this. And actually, I'm going to turn on the light real quick, so don't go anywhere. All right, so Fragrantica recently added a fragrance to Raymond Shyland's database, and they added it because of this, this book right here, The Ghost Perfumer. Actually, I'm going to read you a little bit of a blurb from page 50 and 51. So it says, When Pierre Bourdon and Francois moved north, these headquarters were occupied by highly accomplished fine fragrance figures. Raymond Shyland had done work on Givenchy 3 for women in 1970, and authored Balenciaga Ho Hang for Men in 71, Yves Saint Laurent Perron that same year, plus Molyneux Quartz and Monsieur Carven at the end of the 70s. Never smelled either of those two. And, though the record books often overlook this, Shylan had already contributed a great deal to what would become Yves Saint Laurent's opium. Specifically, he contributed to the Mandarin Orange carnation and the spice accords of the fragrance okay so um let that sink in for just a minute there because if um that is true obviously jean louis jean louis suizak who's one of my favorite perfumers of all time i would never knock him actually you have bad things to say about jean louis suizak i will fight you um but He's credited with the final formula, if you will. He's credited with the man who brought that alde aldehyde accord to the head of opium and, um, you know, that sort of um, uh, apopanax, sort of rich, thick, uh, one of the greatest orientals of all time. And, and obviously, the uh, people who sort of try to knock opium compare it to um, the... Uh, original Youth Do by Estee Lauder, which came out in the 50s. So this is decades later. And there is a little bit of a similarity to um, to, to, to Youth Do by, by Estee Lauder. But Opium, for me, is one of the greatest Oriental fragrances of all time. If it's true that Raymond Chilin built the top, the orange top, the, the Mandarin orange top with the Spice Accord and all that stuff, right? He deserves credit for the fragrance. Um, and if you go to, let's say, Parfumo, and you type in opium, there are two perfumers that are given credit. Jean-Louis Suizak and Jean Amic. Jean Amic actually shows up in this book over and over again. He was Pierre Bourdon's boss um, later on. Um, and so, but Raymond Chilin is right there with those guys, working alongside of them. Um... And so this beautiful sort of uh, myrrh, Papanax Oriental, one of the greatest Orientals. I will review this of all time. I will review this in my uh, Vintage Hall of Fame series one day. It deserves a full review. It deserves all of the credit and love. Probably one of, and, and I've probably at this point in my journey smelled thousands of perfumes, one of the greatest smelling fragrances I've ever smelled, uh, just hands down. And I know some people keep this for winter time, and that's probably exactly what it's made for. But man, with I sometimes I just get the craving, like I gotta spray this in summer. You know, it's uh, it's it's just a pure love, especially in these old bottles, the um, Charles of the Ritz versions of opium. My God, man! Uh, and even the vintage eau de, eau de parfum, which they which they used to call secret de parfum are out of this world. I'll do a full review on 
on uh, the Secret de Parfum and a full review on the EDT one day as well. But Raymond Chilin deserves the credit for opium. So opium's number two for me. Now you might ask, how is opium number two? If it's one of the greatest orientals of all time, how is it number two? Well, it's number two because I recently learned he created a fragrance. Now this is secondhand information, but you know what? I'm gonna go with it because I don't know who the perfumer of this is. And I got a phone call from someone who says they have proof that they figured that they basically have proof that Raymond Chilin created this fragrance. And I'm going to roll with it in this in this list. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, okay? But um, since somebody who I know, uh, a friend, a no excuse me, a knowledgeable perfume friend who knows people, basically called me and said, hey, Raymond Chilin is the perfumer of this. Um, I know it to be true. I have proof, that kind of thing. I'm going to go with it. And so number one for me is Balenciaga's Portos. Now, Balenciaga's Portos is also a fragrance that is going to get a full review for me. And it's funny because if you sort of put me on the spot and you said, Ramsey, Castorium is your favorite note. Yes? It, yes. It's my favorite animalic note, if you will. Leather's my favorite note, okay? Three of the all-time great Castorium fragrances go. Obviously, Antaeus pops up number one. There's no question in my mind. Antaeus is the is the is the god fragrance for me. And Antaeus was a god. He was grounded to the earth. Um, but if you said, okay, two more, quick. Some people are gonna go all over the place with this question, right? For me, I don't know what the third one is, but I can tell you what the second one is, and it's this. It is Portos. Um, the castorium in this is unlike anything I've ever smelled outside of. There's one other fragrance that comes to mind. Um, one other fragrance that, that comes to mind, and it's nowhere near as, I would say, as, as, um, it's nowhere near as such a statement maker. Well, it is a statement maker, but this has a, a, a ability to be, um, extremely sharp and slightly metallic and but it's sort of a you know for 1980 it's a perfect 1980 fragrance it fits right in because it's harsh it's brash it's extremely masculine it's sort of one of those get out of my way masculine fragrances i love these type of fragrances it's coriander bergamot and mugwort with cedarwood patchouli geranium jasmine and vetiver with castorium, leather, frankincense, myrrh, moss, musk, and labdanum. And um, this fragrance is long discontinued, extremely hard to find. There's no perfumer on any of the sites. Um, and so if it's true, Raymond Chiland created Portos, I'm going to say this is his greatest creation. All right, that's, that's going to be my declaration. Even though... He contributed to opium, and opium is probably uh, the fragrance that made the biggest splash. For me, for a vintage lover, for a vintage fragrance lover's taste, I think Portitos is. And this is going to get its own full review. I will just show you real quick a fragrance. If, if you're somebody who loves sort of the um, overall idea of portitos but you just find it way too brash and animalic and in your face and there is something about the castorium in portos which just goes on and on and on hours and hours in um, and these type of fragrances are really meant to mix in with your skin and your body odor and chemistry right um and you know these are these can be challenging fragrances these are very loud you have to remember in the 80s there was people smoking cigarettes on airplanes and in surgery rooms and um, at breakfast tables, and also there was catalytic converters weren't like they were today, so there was more smog. All the stuff that happened in the 80s where fragrances had to be louder, plus that was sort of the style. Um, it is loud, it's brash, it's masculine, it's it's all the, all those things are true, but I love it for that. I love it for, for that exact thing. But if you're someone who says, man, I really wish I had a Portitos-like fragrance that was just a little bit more wearable, maybe a little bit more buttoned up, a little bit more elegant, a little bit more um, acceptable in today's time. I would tell you to check out this. This is Etienne Eigner Silver. Now, this came out a couple years after Portitos. Unfortunately, it is just as hard to find as Portos. Um, I was... 
Uh, I was able to uh, secure a couple of these little bad boys, luckily. I think these are 10 mils. Um, and so I will do a full review of this as well, as far as vintage all-time great fragrances, because this deserves it as well. This is my um, favorite Eigner fragrance. Super Fragrance is a very close runner-up, but I think this is my all-time favorite, Eigner. So, um, yeah, that's my countdown. Fingers crossed that w that information on Portos is true, that it's a Raymond Chilin. Um, if it's not, I'm, I'm going to say his work on opium is, is you know, his, is his greatest. He deserves, even if it's just the top of the fragrance, opium being what it is, he deserves, I think, his flowers for this. Um, and it's funny, Fragrantica actually does now have opium listed as a Raymond Chilin. So, that's my list. We'll keep it under an hour. I appreciate everyone watching. If you have smelled any of his other creations, do let me know. I uh, love seeing your faces in the comments, as always. Leave a comment. Thanks to everyone who does all the things I never ask, liking and subscribing and all that shit that I really don't care about. But what I do care about is celebrating you guys. And um, when I look at the success of this channel, I like to think about what you have done for the channel, not really me, because I couldn't do this without you. I mean, I could, but I'd just be talking to myself. It's really about me interacting and talking with you, speaking with you, having a conversation and all that stuff. And we're coming up on 5,000 subscribers, which I'm very proud of. But it, again, it's really, for me, it's the mirror paradox. When when something like this happens, I like to turn it around and, and point it back at you guys, because um, it... It, that's the whole reason for this channel is is you out there you who's watching me today and you who's watching me in the future um and and so you know uh, for 5000 subscribers i want to do something special i just don't know exactly what that something special is yet so i've gotten a lot of great recommendations it's right around the corner it's going to be any any day we'll hit 5000 subscribers so um if you have a recommendation do let me know uh you know, I've done some crazy things in the past. I did a top 100. I did a top 100 designer fragrances, I believe. Um, so I've done some crazy celebratory videos in the past. But um, but yes, thank you for getting us to the 5,000 subscriber mark. And also, um, you know, recommendations would be appreciated. I will pick something very soon. We'll do a celebratory 5,000 subscriber bash, if you will. So thank you to everyone who is uh, part of the channel. I appreciate every single one of my subscribers. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of the video. Cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.